Hello everyone, and welcome to this video about stereo projections in Godot. First off, apologies for the fan noise. I have to get a proper microphone, but it will have to do for now. Also, I'm not an expert on this. Um, the following is based on what I've learned so far. Hopefully it will still be useful to you. To do what we'll discuss, you'll need a few enhancements that have not yet been accepted into the main branches of Godot. I will link the pull requests needed in the description of the video below. Before we get into stereo projections, let's first go over some basics in mono projection. Note the scene I've created here reproduces a test environment I first saw used in a really cool video by Johnny Lee, where he demos his head tracking solution using the remote controllers. I've added a link to that below as well, it's worth checking out. Note there are a few things added to the scene for the purposes of this video. For instance, you wouldn't normally put a camera into a viewport, as I've done here when you're doing mono projection. Also for now, ignore the second camera that we've got here. That's um, just for demo purposes later on. Our camera currently is a stock standard projection camera in Godot. It has four important values. The first is the field of view, which is currently set to 60 degrees. This is the angle of vision that determines how much we can see. Next are the near and far plane. These are very specific to computer graphics. Unlike the human eye that can see light years into the distance, just look at the stars at night, we need to constrain this on a computer. We can only see things further away than the near plane, but not further away than the far plane. The further these are apart, the more trouble our GPU has rendering objects correctly, mostly to do with the z-buffer. The last option is the keep aspect option. This can be set to keep width, which means that the width of what we're rendering stays the same, or keep height, which means that the height um, is, stays the same. And obviously for heights, the width will change, and for width, the height will change. When we look at uh, mono projection like we were doing over here, the best is to keep this on the default, the keep height option. Um, this means that our projection automatically adjusts itself depending on whether you are rendering on a standard definition monitor or whether you're on a widescreen monitor or things like that. But for our stereo projection, it actually makes sense to keep it on the keep width because of our calculations that we're doing. For this video, I am, however, keeping it on keep height, and you'll eventually see I have to do some extra calculations to make sure things work correctly. I've set our camera up so that if we move our camera, we keep looking at the look at point. So you'll see that our scene rotates around as I move the camera. It gives a pretty neat illusion of 3D, um, really making the targets seem to rotate around and move around even though we're looking at a 2D screen. One thing to, uh, to realize that is important here is that you're still sitting still and your monitor is sitting still. We're basically moving the world around us. If I would be moving our camera through this world, you know, the illusion is made that we are moving through this world. Let's move our camera all the way to the left. What you see is now correct for sitting in front of your monitor, but it's no longer correct if you move your head far to the left as well. I have the same problem as Johnny had in his video, that I can't really demo how incorrect this is while you're looking at a screen. You can't move your head in exact sync with how I'm moving the camera, and it ruins the effect. So I'm employing a similar trick by rendering to a texture and using a second camera to mimic the viewer moving. So let's turn this camera on. You'll now see that our render texture is as if there's actually a screen in the room. And we'll turn the animation on to simulate moving our head from left to right. And it kind of still looks okay, but if you pay attention to the walls, it's like we're double rotating. This is because while the monitor, monitor remains stationary, we render the scene as if the monitor has moved through our world along with us. And then we move in real life and the monitor seems to rotate in real life. And that gives us a double rotation effect. 
If we don't want to rotate our monitor, we don't want to rotate our projection plane, we can turn off our look at. Note that the spectator cam is still rotating as you would still be turning to face your monitor. Doesn't look right at all. The problem now is that our whole projection plane moves. Now it looks as if the whole room moves from left to right. What we need is an asymmetrical view first. Of all. So let's use our new mode. Now I've made it so that as I change this to the frustum mode, that it also updates the frustum the way that it should. Now that actually looks a whole lot better. The double rotation is now gone, the room no longer seems to move. If I was able to add proper head tracking, you would get the same effect Johnny had in his video. Let's go and see how our viewport actually looks. Now that looks really weird, doesn't it? Let's turn our walls off for a second. Here we can see the effect of our asymmetrical frustum. The ray cast shows us the two halves of our frustum. Note how the left side and the right side keep changing sizes independently of each other. If we rotate our viewport a little, we can see how our frustum nicely lines up with our screen. So what does this have to do with stereoscopic rendering? Let's have a look at a stereoscopic setup. We're first going to look at rendering to a 3D monitor. I set this up in the way most people start and soon find out leads to some interesting challenges. The beginning is straightforward. I have an origin point which denotes the position of our head and we've got two cameras, one for our left eye and one for our right eye. I also again have a look at point to denote where we're, what we're looking at. Note that I have not configured viewports. You will need this if you're going doing this for a real game, but I'll devote a separate video to that another day. For now we're just previewing each camera in the viewports below. Again I have a script attached to my root node that is constantly updating things for demo purposes. This script introduces a very important variable, the IOD, or intraocular distance, which denotes the distance between our two eyes. This value is given in centimeters, but scaled according to our game world, and our cameras are positioned accordingly. 6.5 centimeters is a pretty average value for an adult, and generally works well. Unlike our example with the mono camera, we aren't interested in head tracking here. We assume the player is sitting stationary in front of his or her monitor. As a result, when we move the origin position around, we're rotating to face our look at point. But let's leave it at the base. What is, however, important are our cameras. I'm using the frustum camera mode here to show the frustum, but the cameras are set to stock standard 60 degrees field of view cameras. Note that both cameras are pointed at the look at point. You can see that with the ray casts that show the direction. This feels right. It is what your eyes are doing. Just put your finger in the air, look at it, and move your finger to your nose. Well, you know the old trick. You'll see that your eyes go towards the, your finger and you, you know, get cross-eyed. But the same problem applies here as we have with our head tracking example. The monitor isn't moving along. It's still facing your head the same way. As we are rotating our camera, we're double adjusting and we'll get a very distorted and uncomfortable result. It's hard to demonstrate here, but if I bring the far plane back, we can see how the frustrums do not align. Notice how they're both at a different angle from each other. Our cameras have to keep looking forward, but simply turning off the look at calculation isn't enough. While our frustrums are now in the same plane, they are shifted. Think back to our head tracking example, how our frustrum was overlapping our screen. We want our frustrums to end up in the same place. This is the calculation that we want. Where the frustrums nicely overlap at the look at distance. Let's have a look at the source code that does this for us. Here we find our new method set perspective for i that sets up the, the frustum correctly. 
it takes six parameters. The first three are familiar, our VOF, our near plane, and our far plane. But then we have three new properties, the first of which is the I for which we're setting our thrust drum. The second is our IOD, but we need to scale this by um, our world measurements, and you can see that I'm also dividing it by the aspect ratio. Remember again at the beginning of my video, I talked about the keep aspect being set to height, and that being a little bit more difficult for our calculations here. And then the last one is our convergence distance. We are using our look at point for our convergence distance at this point in time, which is you know pretty fair. Um, but you'll also f often find that this is a constant that someone set that works well for the world that they're rendering. Think of the convergence distance as the distance on which you're focusing. And anything that will be in front of the distance will seem to pop out of your screen, while anything that's behind this distance will seem to be inside of the screen. Now here's the funny bit. The person playing your game is rarely sitting where you expect them to be. Our brain is pretty good, however. As the person moves forward or backwards, the perception of death simply changes. Move left or right, and you actually experience a sense of looking around. But the illusion breaks when you move too far. A good reason you never want to sit too far from the middle of the cinema when you're going to see a 3D movie. Last but not least, let's have a look at head-mounted devices. Our starting point is the same as with our stereo camera. We get a curveball thrown at us. Again, we have our two cameras, and we have a stand-in for our LCD screen and for two lenses. But now it gets funny. I'm ignoring for a minute that our lenses apply a magnification, and we need to deal with lens distortion and the effect on our field of view. I'll do a follow-up video on that some other day. The setup here is pretty much what you get with a cheap cardboard device, where we're simply playing with our focal point. This setup would actually work, well, kind of. Some very simple games started like this, and with the right phone, it would get a good result. Unlike our 3D monitor example, each eye is seeing its own screen. Each sees only half of the LCD panel. Our left eye sees the left half, our right eye sees the right half. The problem is that our eye is not nicely in front of the center of the screen. You can see here that it's slightly to the left. The dimension of this, my screen here is set to 10.5 centimeters, which is roughly the width of my iPhone 7 screen. You would need a phone that is exactly double the size of your IOD, so 13 centimeters in our case. A 7 Plus or Samsung S7 would probably be much closer. But for any display that is either wider or smaller than double our IOD, we again need an asymmetric frustrum. We need to know the width of our screen, our IOD, and how far our screen is from the eyes. The result is as follows. You'll notice how low a field of view we're left with. This is why we need lenses with magnification. But as I said, that is a topic for a follow-up video. For now, let's finish looking at the code. Note the adjustment for aspect ratio, which we need to do due to our cameras being set to fit height. Change to fit width, and you can leave this out. We calculate three values. Half our IOD for the inner part of our frustrum. Half the difference between our screen width and our IOD for the outer frustrum. and a quarter of our screen width to get half our frustum height, again only adjusted by aspect ratio due to our fit height mode. Note that all three need to be divided by the distance between the LCD screen is from our eyes. Finally, we use the new set frustum method to set our frustums, and that guess gives us our proper projections for an H and D. That's it for this video. I will do a follow-up video, hopefully pretty soon, to start looking at the uh, effects of magnification on uh, head-mounted devices and how to set up proper viewports so that you can actually render to split screen. Um, I've got all the code for this ready, I just need to find some time to actually make the video. 
But for now, I hope that you learned something out of this video, and um, well, give it a like if you uh, if you found it interesting.